Good afternoon, good evening, and welcome. It's been, <laughs> you've no idea what this year's been like. You have no idea. Last year when we had COVID, it got berserk and we all thought we could never go through this again and it can't get worse. Well, guys, I'm telling you now, it has got worse. We have been so busy. We've got Sally and Tim, who are quite new to us, obviously, and they've come into it. Talk about running. They, they just, I, I don't think they knew what hit them. Poor old Tim is just in a, a, a complete state of, of shock the whole time because, I mean, they're getting away. Often I see Sally here at one o'clock in the morning um, and she's still going strong and I tell her to go home and she won't and we have big rows about that. So starting around with your vets is not a good thing to do, <laughs> but I just needed to get some sleep. I'd rather go home and be all right tomorrow than flake out for a week. It's been that busy, guys. It has been that it busy. Has. And obviously we've got a lot of things going on at 20 Acres. We've got a lot of educational products, projects, products that we're working on. So yeah, it's, um, it's pretty flat out. And as I get to 70, I find I have to go twice as hard at everything to keep up the speed I used to do when I used to do it 10 years ago. So Laurie's got so much to look forward to. Um, he's oh losing God. his hair nearly as quickly as mine, as you can see. I am, it's terrifying. He, just before we came on air, he was brushing it like crazy to make sure it looked reasonably good. I said, be like mine, you can't it see it anyway. It, it can never look good, Spine. let's be honest. It, just, it makes me look slightly less bald than I am, I think. Absolutely, I've got all the cameras at the wrong angles because we're so busy we don't have time to set anything up. But welcome, welcome to Wildlife Aid and the insanity of wildlife rehabilitation. That's what we're all about. Um, what should we do? Let's work all sorts of things. So we've been doing, we haven't done many rescues actually, not as many rescues as normal. I'm getting really, I don't like not doing rescues. Um, and the only, go, well, uh, I'm going to get this over with now. I'm going to get it over with because otherwise it's going to uh, blow I know where we're going. evening. We've had one fantastic rescue and I was in a meeting with the trustees. So Laurie couldn't ring me even if he wanted to. So off he went and did the rescue, which I will now let him talk about while I have 18 cigarettes, 16 Bacardis, and a sleep. Off we go. <laughs> Laurie, the screen is yours. So, a bit of background information on this. Um, Simon is always a big fan of new rescues, things that make you think, things that make you think on your feet that aren't just effectively doing the same thing over and over and over again. Uh, and the one that we had recently is actually, as far as I'm aware, certainly the first in several years, uh, and it's one that I don't think you've done before, and it's this one. Uh, this is the, the two male roe deer. So uh, we've had a lot of people saying that they're youngsters. They're actually fully grown adult males. Um, they're just a very, very small species. Technically they're called bucks rather than stags, but I know a lot of people aren't 100% sure about uh, which one of those is correct. But they had been caught together whilst rutting. So unfortunately the antlers had managed to lock together and for about an hour and a half, something like that, they were stuck together and were unable to free themselves. So we had to go over, uh, and as Simon did say, he was busy at the time and now hates me forever. Um, but luckily, I don't know if you have seen the video, but we were able to catch them, and just with a small um, removal of a tiny bit of the antler, we were able to set them free, and both went their separate ways. But it certainly was quite a fun rescue, certainly a very different rescue. Really nice to see them both run off, uh, and I've heard nothing but abuse about it ever since we did it. I think the good thing about it, it honestly, Laurie, they had to just cut a tiny, tiny little nodule off the antlers, which which, which are dead anyway. Then it's not as if they're living tissue; they're they're dead that bit of the antler. But I think the most interesting thing was uh, everybody thought before Laurie went on this rescue that one of them was dead because one of them was sort of pulling the other one around. It wasn't trying to move. Laurie got there and they thought it was actually dead when they got there. They realised when they got right on top of it, it wasn't. But then obviously the, the fitter one ran straight off and I think Laurie was a bit hard in his mouth for a minute or two because the other one yeah. didn't move. But that very quickly uh, got to his feet and ran off in the other direction. So it was a really nice rescue, guys. I have to admit it was a nice rescue. Laurie didn't do it as well as I would have done. Um, <laughs> But, no. Actually, I, I was terrified on this because Simon didn't know what happened, didn't watch any of the footage or anything like that. We edited the video, we actually posted the video out, and Simon hadn't seen it at all. He refused point blank to look at it. Uh, and then Simon and Lou, who's our deputy CEO, uh, and might be in the chat at the moment, uh, if so, hello Lou, um, managed to watch it at the same time together, and I've never been so scared in having my work critiqued before. 
Because <laughs> I thought he was just going to tear it apart and say, you did this wrong, you did this wrong, you did this wrong. But actually, you were quite you were quite nice about it, which is rare. It's like any rescue. Laurie and I did a rescue last year sometime. It was a duckling by the side of the lake. It was in the water, and you just got to choose your time to go for it. And I was behind, because Laurie got there first. He was sort of closer to do it, so I just let him go. Um, and he was standing there and standing there. I was thinking, Laurie, you're going to miss it. You're waiting too long. You're an idiot. You haven't going to get You're not going to get away. <laughs> and he just bent down and picked it up. You've got to move very quickly. I mean, this is when I say bent down and picked it up, he had to really it. move to pick it up. He dived on it. But he caught it and it went. But it's like any rescue. I can be on a rescue and I will probably grab something or do something at a different time to Laurie. You've got to do it when you're in sync with the animal. And neither of us will ever be in sync at exactly the same time. So yeah. he actually made a great job of that rescue. He did what I've done before. He got too close to the antlers on a couple of occasions with his head. I've done that because I've had an antler there and that actually penetrated this, the, the head. I had an antler in the neck, which really did me quite a lot of damage as well. But, you know, you only go for it when you can. And Laurie, I will say this to him because he never, he will never take, Laurie will never take a compliment. He, is as, he as, is as good a rescuer as I am. I've had about three rescuers in my life who I really trust and like working with. One is Sean Kells, one is Laurie, the other one is Steve Preston. They've all been brilliant at rescues. They really have got it. Um, and not many people have. I can't describe why or how. People so many times have asked me to write a book about how you rescue. And at the end of the day, it is all about instinct. And you, to me, no book helps. You've either got it or you haven't. And I knew very quickly with Laurie, I mean, it's the only reason I've continued to employ him, to be honest, because you could see after we'd done four or five rescues together, he was exactly in focus with the animal. You've got to be absolutely in sync with the animal to know what you're doing. You've got to know when to go for it. Sometimes, yes, we do. Both of us have to move very quickly, but the majority of the time you can move very slowly. We had a, 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 a badger release the other night and, you know, badgers are not the easiest thing and people grasp them and they fight like crazy. And we wanted to get this badger from where it was in its pen into a cage and I can imagine 90% of people would have prodded it with sticks and done all sorts of things and pushed it or grasped it and you just put the cage in the right place you very gently and you do you talk to it I know it sounds insane but I think an animal picks up not the, what you're saying to it but it picks up um, a mood and an atmosphere or whatever you want to call it. it it knows that you're not meaning it harm and this animal just looked at me looked at the cage trottled around for what not more than about 30 seconds and just toddled into the cage by itself no stress no hassle to the animal at all and then it went and it went off for a really nice release um i don't yeah. think we got that tonight but it, we took it back to where it was found it had been with us a long time it had some severe bite wounds obviously territorial fighting it was a, a semi well it was, no, it was a mature adult male middle age i would have thought probably three or four years old um, um and then while it was with us it actually uh got a prolapse which is a prolapse of the bottom a bottom prolapse rather like Laurie has all the time and we're off the air we're off the air um, but that causes a bit of problem you know we had to make sure that that was healed that it was fine and in the end it did get better but it was with us quite a few weeks um, but it toddled off and it knew where it was as soon as it came out the cage it knew exactly where it was going to it toddled off stage left um, and it was a very nice release so the releases are always brilliant but as I say with rescues it's all about feeling and Laurie does have it. As much as he'll deny it and won't take a compliment on air, he can't really ignore me. So good stuff on you, Laurie. You did it good, man. Yes. Oh, thank you. Um, right. I would say re rescuing is it's a very, very personal thing. I think you'd agree with that. Yeah. Um, the way two people do different, uh, the same rescue is completely different. No one will ever do it the same way, go at the same time, anything like that. And it's, as Simon said, it's all about and it's, it sounds really weird, but it's honestly, you've got to be in sync. Yeah, getting in, in tune with what the animal is going to do and then trying to preempt it beforehand. Uh, and I, I'd, I'm sure that if any of um, the guys from any of the other rescue centers are in the chat, you'd agree as well. It's, it really is a personal thing. And when you're on a rescue, it, it's all about you and that animal. And whilst you, you're working with someone else, it's, it's very much about how you and that animal interact. Uh, I think you'd agree with that. But I, I, I do I, remember yeah. my first ever rescue that you sent me on because I started here originally just filming uh, and editing and we got out of the car on a rescue it was a fox uh, that was collapsed under a hedge I believe uh, and we got out I filmed you getting out of the car and as you got out of the car you grabbed the camera from me turned it round on me and went good luck you're doing this one and that was it it's where that you learn it. 
my first <laughs> rescue, no, right in at the deep nobody had ever told me anything. It was a rescue which I thought was going to be reasonably easy. I mean, you don't, you know, Laura and I, not being immodest, we don't go out on the dead easy rescues because there's lots of other people who can do it for us. But uh, we go out on those and it's it's just, it is instinct. And I knew Laurie would do it. I had no doubt because I'd seen him on a couple of rescues doing stuff before. And it was really good. But it, it's, yeah, it's gut instinct and you've got to feel what the animal's going to do. And Laurie and I will probably do it different times, which is why when we go on a rescue, if I'm running the rescue, then Laurie does what I says. And if I say to Laurie, go for it, I will do what he says because you can't have two people running the rescue because you don't know when the, what the other one's going to do when. You've got to just wait. And when you're in balance with the animal, when you know you can do it, you go for it. So, no, that's cool. Good stuff so far, Mr. Brady. <laughs> so, in terms of, uh, just before we get into a couple of questions, I know a whole load of questions have come in um, on the chat, both on Facebook and on YouTube. So, hello to you all. Thank you. Oh, for that's, uh, hang on, Laurie, stop for, for a minute. Questions. Oh. Laurie, stop for a minute. Are, are um, you getting yeah. on the fact that people are shocked that you're being nice yeah, to yeah. me by any chance? Lou, is your dad... To be fair, this so is, am I. Uh, listen, Lou, is your dad okay? I've never heard him be so nice to Laurie. It's only, guys, it's only because I'm so tired I haven't <laughs> got the energy to be sparkly. Yeah, Laurie and I are both yeah, He's going to come in here and give me a no, verbal barrage. Got We've got... I mean, Laurie is probably more tired than I am. We work ridiculous hours. We work seven days a week. It's just insanity at the moment. I love it, and I whinge about it every day, but I wouldn't change it. But it is that busy. I don't think we've ever been so busy before. Anyway, Laurie, off you go. You're in the middle of a wonderful story, which I was going to have a little sleep while you said it. <laughs> um, so it has been incredibly busy here um, over the past month, actually, that we've been off air. It doesn't feel like a month. It's just passed instantly. Um, but a lot of the rescues at this time of year fall into quite um, similar categories, really. So we've had a lot of animals, but they fall into groups. So if I can try and work my way through some of the things on this. I'm not sure if you can hear me, Ron, but it's just to say um, there's still a frozen delivery out the front of reception. That needs there is still a frozen delivery. So, it's frozen Ron, delivery. if you're watching the live stream, just so you know, there is a delivery. frozen delivery outside the front of reception. And that also proves that, that Alice is here three hours after she should have gone home. Alice also <laughs> works seven days a week. You can't tell her not to be here. She's working all this weekend, so I've just been told. And I had a go at her about that. But Travis, when Alice is in a bad mood, you do not cross Alice. Trust me, guys. It's the worst thing you do. A, she speaks more loudly. B, her voice goes up about three octaves, she is scary. And, and she's only four foot nothing, but I'm very, very scared of her when she's in a bad mood. You're so here she is now, you can hear it. I'm going to get it for this as well. I don't care, Laura. I'm so, I'm so tired, I don't care. Uh, anyway, so as um, some of you guys that joined us on the last live stream will know, we've had a huge um, glut, really, of uh, baby bats recently. So. This is a young pipistrelle, I believe a soprano pipistrelle. Um, this is probably the youngest one we've had recently, but we've seen a whole load of them, um, varying in size from these guys, which are a lot small, uh, a lot smaller, up to ones that look a lot more like adults. This is still a youngster, but it looks a lot more like an adult bat. Uh, and they've come in for a variety of reasons. I've just been deafened by Simon's phone, because yours you is have. very loud. My phone never stops. <laughs> Um, they've come in for a variety of reasons. A lot of them, unfortunately, caught by oh, cats. No, I'm going to stop you again now. Oh. See, this is, I th expect calls on my phone that are important, that are really, you know, important to listen to. Um, message. I won't tell you who the sender was at the moment. I am gobsmacked by your niceness to Laurie. Where is Simon Cowell? And what have you done with him? The Signed. Is, even Signed. Even know you personally Signed. know that this is weird. Jill Braley. That's, oh, so that's Laurie's mummy. That's <laughs> Laurie's mummy. So, Jill, I'm always nice to oh, Laurie. You God. only ever hear the bad bits, and Laurie only ever tells you the bad bits. Actually, I do praise him an awful lot uh, of the time. Never I'm, I'm on air. Tired. Good. <laughs> Excellent. Laurie, continue. So, uh, as we were saying, we've had an awful lot of bats recently. Most of them are pipistrelles, either the common pipistrelle or the soprano pipistrelle. They've come in, a lot of them sadly have been attacked by cats or have had uh, wounds to the wing membranes. Um, these, they look quite bad, sort of the tears to the wing membranes, but they can heal really well um, if treated and given enough time. 
these guys are currently with the, the team over at um, Surrey Bat Rescue who do an awful lot of work for us. So thank you very much to uh, you guys if you are watching. But we've kept you busy with a lot of bats at the moment. A lot of them tangled up in uh, cobwebs as well. So I don't know if any of you remember, a couple of months ago we had a space of things attacked. Um, tangled up in cobwebs. It's amazing how much, uh, how restrictive they can be to quite small animals. Uh, and we do get bats that literally can't open their wings because there's too many cobwebs around them. Very, very weird, but uh, quite nice just to gently uh, tease them off and see them finally free. Well, the strength of a cobweb is amazing. They say mm. it's stronger than steel. And if you've got a yes. cobweb on the side of your car, I've often been driving along as a cobweb from one of my wing mirrors to the roof and you can be doing 70 miles an hour, and it doesn't move, it's still there, it doesn't break. It just shows the incredible tensile strength, really, of a cobweb. Massive things, we should reproduce that, that material to make things out of it ourselves. I think we're missing a trick here, Laurie. <laughs> I could put it over Laurie's mouth so he couldn't talk. I, this, uh, that's another, I'm many getting back tried. now, I'm getting back now. <laughs> We also, we had a hedgehog with quite an interesting condition. So we'll put the photo up first and then we'll explain what's going on. So this is something called balloon syndrome. And it sounds very, very odd, but it's something that's surprisingly common with hedgehogs. Uh, and it is effectively what in the veterinary world is called subcut or subcutaneous emphysema. Uh, it's air trapped under the skin. So between the, the main body tissues and the external layer of skin. Uh, with you, me, birds, anything like that, usually that's just a small bubble, almost like a blister. But with hedgehogs, they have so much um, space under the skin that they can swell up to massive sizes. And this hedgehog, no joke, was the size of a football. Uh, and it's incredibly painful, uh, incredibly uncomfortable, but luckily it's actually relatively easy to deal with once you've found it. And all it takes is a small syringe put through the side and then we effectively suck all that air out and the hedgehog looks a lot a lot more <laughs> relaxed when fully It's like a squashed hedgehog, Laurie. He's a squashed <laughs> hedgehog now. What have you done to that poor hoglet? <laughs> Uh, interesting enough, Alice said he was released this evening and the lovely people donated £100. So thank you very much to uh, the very kind guys that brought this guy in. Thank you. That's um, brilliant. That's brilliant. With balloon syndrome, um, the main thing that you need to worry about is why the animal is inflated to the size it has. So usually that is caused by air escaping from the mouth, the breathing passageways into the skin layer. So with this one, unfortunately, I believe it was a fracture uh, in the skull that was allowing the air that the hedgehog was breathing in and out to move into uh, the subdermal space. Luckily, that healed really, really well. We were keeping an eye to see if he was reinflating again. He didn't reinflate, and as Alice has said in the chat, uh, he's actually gone back out to the wild. So hopefully that won't be happening again, but it's a very, very odd case whenever we get one of those, as I'm sure you'd agree. It's interesting. It's an interesting case to get. And it, obviously the lungs, you get a tiny puncture in the lung wall as well. That can cause the same thing. But normally these will heal. If you take the pressure off them by letting the air out, it gives that, that tiny hole a chance to heal. Um, and it all gets better again. Have you got any questions on the Facebook feed, Laurie? Because we never look at the Facebook feed. We, we only have the We, we have, have a the number YouTube of questions on. going in. So Give me some. Uh, Give me a some. question. Hi, I'm Alfie, age seven. Hello, Alfie. Uh, we love watching our rescues. Thank you very much. That's very kind. Uh, what do you think is the hardest rescue job you've ever done? Working with Laurie. <laughs> Easy. Absolutely obvious. The hardest rescue is having to work with Laurie. Oh, it's difficult. Every it's rescue very difficult. is every rescue is different. Um, it's it's nearly impossible to tell you which is the hardest. Over forty I, years, we've done so many. I Laurie's think done the one nothing, that you, uh, on your side of things, there's a couple that sort of bring about. One is the the nest of I believe it was jackdaws. I'm not sure that was down a chimney that you actually had to climb onto the roof and lower a soup ladle down the chimney to scoop the nest up and bring it back up. That's certainly quite a weird one. Uh, and the other one that you like a lot is the, I believe it was a deer that was trapped between two fences, but about six feet down, which was something, do, do you want to go through that? Because that's Well, that was with Sean. Sean, when Lucy was here and Sean, her husband, did a lot of rescues with me and he was absolutely brilliant. Um, it was a deer stuck about 10 foot down between a shed and a wall. There wasn't enough room for us to get down with it, so we just had to sort of lean down with, with a grasper and try to grasp it. And we had to grasp it, obviously not on the neck with the deer, we had to grasp it between the front legs and the back legs, so we had to do a bit of manoeuvring. 
and then lift it out and it was quite heavy it's only 25 kilos but when you're trying to lift this out on a grasper it's quite difficult um, and you only get one shot at it because it's going to go berserk otherwise so that was a Sean and I rescue which is actually somewhere on YouTube I think it is um, yeah and it you looks, also have got to be very, very quick with a deer as well. With foxes yeah. and things like that, you can take things slower, you can think about it a lot more. But because deer get catch myopathy, which is effectively stress-related heart attack cell death, um, it, you have to move surprisingly quickly. So I think you had to think on your toes for that one. Think on my toes? I'll think on my toes, Laurie. Laurie, Laurie's, had a few drink. not Laurie Laurie's had a few drinks. He's thinking on his toes not thinking on his feet. What he doesn't tell toes. you is my few drinks is coffee because I'm tired. <laughs> I did spot alcohol I think alcohol I'm on number there. seven today. I sp also sp I spied alcohol earlier on, Laurie. Um, okay, so yeah, that's that. Well, let's move on to another one. But if you've got any questions from Facebook, it'd be nice to try to g give them a bit of an in because we never tend to take any notice of Facebook. We I have a few. For. One from on. Karen. I said, Simon, do you remember trying to catch a goose and you ended up completely soaked to the skin? I, th I swear that's happened multiple times. Yeah, I've had so many times that's happened. It really, you'd have to give me more. It's funnily enough, after all these years, if it's a good rescue, I can often remember them going back pretty much to the beginning. Um, but I don't remember that particular one. But yeah, I have been soaked to skin on many occasions. Often yeah, because Laurie often gets fed up. You with, always he pushes me in the water. Where? Laurie pushes me in the water now. He's getting so cocky with, with his, with his rescue skill that he pushes me in. He just says, Simon, you're in my way. And off I go. I, I've thought about it many times to push you in. It would be quite tempting, but let's uh, so not go down that route because you've been nice to me, so I've got to be nice to you. Well, Anthony Furnival has started the next nice to lorry fund. So you've got <laughs> all you're worth, Laurie, all you are worth. And I'm not dissing your donation because it's brilliant because you've already given before, but Laurie, your net worth is £1.99. I, I, that's about £1.98 more than out of pot. Yeah, I think, so. I think that's about right. I think it's good. Cool. <laughs> Give me another Facebook question. Uh, we've had quite a few, actually. Uh, Pam has asked an interesting one, actually. Why are rescue nets round and not square? Because that's what they sell in the fishing shops. It's quite easy. <laughs> um, you can get square ones. You can get triangular ones. We've got various sorts in the car. We've probably got... As a mostly a sort of uh, odd triangle. Like a rounded triangle, I think. It's like Laurie will be better later. Don't take it. You know, he's getting a bit tired. He hasn't shaved either. I, I, I shaved. For one particular person watching tonight, they'll be pleased to know that I have shaved. I have shaved, even though she's got a tooth missing there, but we can't go there. Um, no, the nets are in different shapes. We've probably got, what, 12 or 14 catch nets in the car of all we different do. sizes. And it's um, always the way that the one that we want is right at the bottom. That's because Laurie we, we always we store them inside. Laurie order, stacks so the car The small wrong. ones on the top and the large ones on the bottom. And I always I've not do used it. a small one in about six years. No. I always store the nets absolutely superbly. Laurie goes out and rescue the car comes back. It is no. a tip. I can't find anything anywhere because he again has mucked it up. I want to get back to being nasty to Laurie. I'm doing my best to get some energy back to be nasty to Laurie. The but only I'm person that's cleaned the car recently is Jacob and me. The yeah, only people that have cleaned out that car. True. You haven't done it true. in months. <laughs> no, true. That's why I have staff. Oh, right? I have staff. God. Go on, give us another question. <laughs> uh, Josh, uh, what's the best route to get into a wildlife rehabilitation career path? That's an interesting Insanity. Answer. I think there's two different uh, answers depending on whether you're in the UK or the US. Testing. Well, you've got to be insane, really, to get into the, the animal rescue route. Um, it's joining. It's joining... Becoming a volunteer at a charity, 90% of the time with any rescues like this, you've got to be a volunteer because we rely on volunteers without them. I mean, the, the staff here this year, we've been so busy, but we have 400 volunteers going absolutely frenetic. I mean, if you think a baby bird, the parents feed the baby bird, they do make about a thousand trips a day. Now we've got anything up to 400 baby birds in. Each of those baby birds is going to eat about half a maggot every half an hour. I, somebody wants to get their calculator out and work that out. So it's 400 baby birds fed every half an hour, half a maggot from dawn till dusk. That's how busy our volunteers are. Without them, we would be we absolutely lost. We have people lost. that never leave the <coughs> um, orphan bird unit we have at the top of the centre. People who spend their entire shift just in there feeding birds. It's now what, absolutely incredible. What, the dedication what, is what just... What people insane. are imagining now, Laurie, is they sleep there as well. That is a gross exaggeration. To, they to be honest, with, with a couple of them, if the option was there, I'm fairly sure they'd take it. <laughs> 
it there are some insane. that will get in early and leave late and would spend the entire day yeah. just in one unit. It's, it's absolutely crazy. incredible. And thank we, you to we any do of the volunteers that are watching this. Thank you so much for your dedication. It is uh, Laurie's not going to let me speak. Laurie, no. Laurie, look, look, Laurie. Uh, um, Laurie. No one wants um. to listen to you. We really need more volunteers. Alice is absolutely screaming for volunteers. Not only, it's not, if you don't like fancy the animal care, we need more receptionist volunteers. We are desperate for volunteers. And in fact, with 20 acres, which I guess we're gonna talk about in a minute, um, now we've built the lakes. I won't say too much about that because you're gonna see that in a minute, but we are looking for volunteers for there as well because we've now got to plant all the aquatic plants, which is gonna be a massive task because you'll see the amount of lakes in a minute. We've then got to clean all the area up. We've got to stream all the river banks. We are looking for volunteers in that area, but what I have promised Alice, because I don't want death by Alice, that would be too <laughs> scary. Uh, I promise Alice that we won't poach any volunteers from her, her, her shift here. We've got to get a new stable of volunteers, so different volunteers who Alice can't claim to, claim to steal from us um, to do 20 acres. 20 acres is going to become um, a place where we're going to need probably three or four volunteers every day from now on because there will be ongoing maintenance even though we haven't gone that far with it yet there's still going to be stuff to do every single day poor old Jacob is going to be absolutely frenetic doing everything he has to do and he was warned yesterday that he's got to get into the lake to plant some of the deeper plants because they're more than knee deep so he's going to have to go in the lake with a dibber dip his hand right down up to about three feet dip a little hole put the plant in and then come out again. So uh, we will get some video of that, guys. It's going to be quite funny, <laughs> and I suspect he will get dunked quite a few times. So uh, we will get on to the progress on the new site a little <coughs> later, but just for a bit of clarification, when Simon says 20 acres, um, most of you don't know entirely what that means. Uh, he's referring to the size the of new the plot of land. So it the is new the centre. new the Wildlife Aid Centre, which is the name of the project and the name that the whole centre will eventually uh, fall under. But because it's 20 acres of land, as we refer to it quite a lot, Simon does call it either 20 acres or 12 acres, depending on which plot he's referring to. So it can get a little confusing. I was very um, good the other day because we did a, I did an interview down there with a, a, a local TV company. Which I think is on. Is it on the website now? Uh, yes, Sorry, it's, it's, uh, yes, so yes. Laurie's got it on the website. It's quite noisy and quite windy, but I actually called it the New Wildlife Aid Centre all the way through. I was very proud of myself. I gave myself it's a pat surprising. on the back. It was. It surprised me. It was total senility. I'd obviously <laughs> forgotten what it was called. But no, there's a lot of work going on there. We will see it later on. But um, it's we've got a manic, manic year. And not only that, we've got so many projects going on that it is draining us all to bits. I mean, that's why Laurie's excuse for not shaving is because he hasn't had time. Um, everybody says you're trying to, to, trying to, trying, trying to grow a goatee, Laurie. Uh, this is what I'm being told on the screen here. Uh, I'm, I'm not allowed to grow a beard. My other half will kill me if I uh, even try. <laughs> Um, there's been a number of comments, especially on Facebook, a few on YouTube as well, uh, regarding something that actually we've seen an awful lot of over the, uh, the past couple of weeks, and that is this. This is mange. Uh, it's probably the, the most common issue other than uh, being hit by a car that we see in foxes. It's caused by a parasitic mite. Uh, and they burrow under the skin that causes intense itching. It's really, really unpleasant. Um, and unfortunately, it's the, the itching of that that causes the fur loss, that causes sores and wounds and other things. And actually, a fox generally doesn't die of mange itself. They die of a secondary issue that is brought up by the mange, usually uh, infection in wound sites or maggot infestations or anything like that. Uh, we have seen an awful lot of that recently, both with youngsters and with uh, adults. We have, I think, five or six uh, new ones over the past couple of days that have come in with mange. They are being treated, but a few people have asked what to do if you have a fox with mange or you find a fox with mange. So there's a couple of different options depending on how severe that mange is. So if it is um, the early stages of mange, so maybe the tail looks a bit scraggy or the rear end looks a bit scraggy, but the, the sort of the face and everything like that looks normal, then to be honest, the, the best response to it is through support feeding and you can provide um, drops that a lot of rescues will send you out or sell, depending on which one, um, that you can put in the food and it just sort of helps their own immune system overcome the mange by themselves. Um, the, very, the main thing with that is support feed, keep them able to cope themselves and they'll be able to overcome it themselves. 
Um, if they have passed that point, they've got it in the face, they've got it around the, the chest, um, they look a lot more like the classic mangy fox, that very scabbed appearance, then they do need medical uh, treatment. There's only so much that support feeding can do, and if it overcomes their immune system, then it's actually very, very difficult to treat without medication. And at that point, then the fox will need to be caught and brought into a wildlife rescue centre where we have um, drugs that can um, deal with that, but they are veterinary prescription only, so they have to be given by a, a rescue centre. They are very effective too. Uh, one of the drugs called Brevecto, which is a, br a brilliant drug. And uh, we had a case the other day where we, a chap came in. He rang me up. He wanted some, but we had to actually, we had to actually give it to him. Um, and he rang up. He says he went away with his pill. And I said, honestly, you know, it's going to give it a month, but it's going to be much, much better. Uh, and he actually rang me up yesterday. I love these calls when you get this where months gone by. I've forgotten all about it. And he rang up and said, my fox is looking superb. And it's a one-off treatment. He only has to have it once. So the fox was given that. He took it back to his home. And it, it's much, much better. So it's really fantastic. What's Laurie? Laurie's, Laurie's moving across. This is across. Bobby. He's very oh, Bob, He's Bobby's dark. Very He's wet. too dark. We it can't see dark. Bobby. Hang on. We oh, can't see Bobby in the dark. He's staying in there, Bobby. He won't. He'll so, run. You know he runs. Absolutely. My Bobby's... He's, He's very, very nervy, my boy. Oh, well, Bobby's gone. gone. But we've Bobby's got Toby gone. in here as well now. So oh, Toby, for they're both now. Both my. You you they don't Toby come in and, and see Abby. me. Um, we've so also got some. Oh, and Bobby's come back in. I bought you yeah, both, boy. My two men. Bobby Boo. Okay, boy. Bobby Boo. And you get a, a secret Abby uh, cameo as well at that point. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I, I now have a Toby. So you might, if suddenly a furry face appears here, I've been attacked by Toby. He, he <laughs> might suddenly start talking. Toby's a great talker. He, he is. talks a lot. He does. He, he will just, he'll walk into the office and just go, ah, 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 until you pay him attention. Yeah, that's, I'm pouring <laughs> myself, if you hear a funny noise, guys, I'm not weeing on the floor. I'm just pouring myself a Coke because I'm very, very dry. Um, any more well, questions, Lloyd, before we click on to the next bit uh, of this? One just coming in uh, from Paolo, do volunteers have to be adults at 18 plus or can they be 16 and over? So unfortunately because of insurance here at the centre we can only accept volunteer applications from those over 18. Unfortunately we don't have any control over that one uh, and that is something we can't do anything about. So unfortunately it is 18 and over on that one. Um, Look, there's quite a few questions that have been coming in. So Zoe has asked, what can I do to encourage hedgehogs and frogs into my garden? Yes. <laughs> Nothing. Nature's brilliant. Nature, is brilliant. Nature will give you what you want. Again, when we come back to 20 acres in a minute, we're going to let nature do what it wants to do. We could plant all sorts of stuff at 20 acres and reseed and whatever. Nature is brilliant. It might take a tiny bit longer but it'll plant what it wants, where it wants, in the right place, for the right soil conditions, and we'll be amazing. So when we go on 20 eggs, we'll talk a bit more, but you know, let, if, they, if they're meant to be in your garden, if you put all these things in your garden, they're not meant to be there, they will suffer. If they're supposed to be there, they will be there. So nature will provide. If you've got a pond in your garden or whatever, um, then they will probably come. And if they don't come, it's not because of anything you've done wrong, but there's something about that habitat which is not right for them. So don't the, force nature. Nature will do what it's got to do. The, the best thing is always to attract any wild species into your garden is make sure that the habitat is there to support it. Uh, if your garden is just a perfectly manicured lawn with no borders, no flowers or anything like that, the chances of you getting badgers, hedgehogs, foxes is actually quite small just because there's, there's nothing there to support them. If you have long grasses and you've got wood piles and you've got wildflower areas and all of that lot, nature will naturally go to those areas. So the, the best thing, if you do want to attract a wildlife species, have a look at what habitat they, um, they generally enjoy. See if they're around in that area and see how you can modify your garden or your area to make it a lot better for that wild animal. And then really it's just a case of hoping um, that they turn up, especially with hedgehogs as well. The main thing that you can do for hedgehogs at the moment is if you do have a fence, make sure that you put a hole in it. So the hole should be about the size of a CD, if you can still remember what those look like. About 15 centimetres um, in diameter. I've made Abby giggle with that one, she wasn't expecting that. Um, about 15 centimetres 15 centimetres in diameter, you can cut those out of the base of your uh, fence and you can actually get little hedgehog highway signs online that uh, you can put on there just to make sure that no one comes and closes it up. 
because uh, they do travel a mile, mile and a half quite easily each night and they do need to be able to traverse the territory, find food, find shelter, find a mate at that time of year and if you box your garden in they just won't turn up because they can't get in. So, sorry, oh sorry, can I speak now Laurie? Oh, no. Laurie's, Laurie's taking over the show. He doesn't need me anymore. I was going to praise him on all that comment about hedgehogs and fences, but what he did forget is if you've got a chain link fence in your garden, um, be very careful. Any sort of fencing with a small hole in it, the hedgehog can get his face through it, but because the spines grow backwards, he then can't pull back out if he gets it wrong. So if you've got chain link in your garden or chain link around a tennis court, if you've got a tennis court, that type of thing, just check it once a day. Just once a day, go around, make sure there's nothing stuck in it so you can get it out, ring us, either do it yourself or ring us, but it get out. So, so many animals get stuck in fences. It's all very well making a hole at a certain point, but animals aren't always that sensible that they look for the hole. They're trying to go through where they can. So, you got, you, you were getting to 10 out of 10, Laurie, but you fell back to 7 out of 10 at the end of uh, that answer. At least I didn't. Quote, what, what was the line that you quoted live on uh, Sky News? Don't oh, feed awesome. hedgehogs water. No, milk and water. Don't feed them milk. Yeah, I know. And I then you continued wrong. to crack your head on a heat lamp. Yeah, I did. I did. It was quite funny, really. But Laurie laughs, Laurie laughs at my misfortune. Everybody it thinks I'm nasty to Laurie. Actually, I'm lovely to Laurie. And off camera, Laurie is absolutely vile to me. Oh, I'm just a horrible person. He is. I, I, I would agree with that. I would Abby, agree with am that. Am I a horrible person? Yeah, the worst. <laughs> See, Laura, Abby agrees as well. Uh, not another one. Keep up the good work. A little bit of that is for the lorry fund. So more money in. A little bit of that for lorry fund from Push Bike Cam. Push Bike Cam. Thank you, um, Simon. You're still looking good, but look at we are. Lorry and I are both. To be honest, we're absolutely knackered. I can't say the word I was going to say in front of that, but you can probably guess what it was. So yeah, but that's what it is. This time of year, it's like that. It's what we call. Silly season, we've called it silly season for years because it's just insane season really, but it's silly season. It will slacken off. Uh, we don't get the winters like we used to. I mean, before when we ran wildlife aid, going back about five or six years, you got to sort of November and every, nothing happened until the end of January or even beginning of February. Now we don't get the harsh winters, so actually we don't get that drop off so totally, but it will be much less pressure on everybody, including the vets, as we move probably through to in, into October. Depending on what climate change throws at us, nobody knows what that's going to do. Um, but this is why we have IDOT. We haven't talked about IDOT yet, but we'll <laughs> probably talk about that later as well. Can we also say as well, it's not just uh, us as well. The, the vet team, the admin team, Alice and the guys up there, the volunteers, everyone has been working absolutely flat out. It's unfortunately, it is just one of the things that always happens at every rescue centre at this time of year. It just becomes manic. And we are still quite a small charity. I know we've got quite a a big reach for uh, the number of people that we actually are but at every rescue centre it always gets flat out um, our vet team as Simon said are working easily sort of 70 80 hour weeks massive amounts of work um, so huge thank you for all the dedication on that side and we genuinely couldn't do it without every single person that um, comes in volunteers works here everything everyone is a vital part of the machine so uh, I think everyone's feeling it at the moment and the volunteers, I mean, the volunteers work amazing shifts. I mean, you know, the, vol the vets get paid a paltry sum because I'm so mean. Laurie gets paid far too much. Abby's paid about the right amount. Um, but no, the volunteers, you, you've got to praise them the, bit, the most, really, because they're, they're just there and they don't get paid a bean. And we've got four or five volunteers who are out on rescues pretty much constantly. Laurie and I are on the rescue list as well, so we get all the messages to our phone. And if it's something really important, yes, of course, we'll go. But so many times you get one of our three or four rescues who go out on that rescue, bring it back, and that's just all all done out of love, isn't it? It's all done out of love, Laurie. It's all about love, isn't it? You know. Yeah. But that, that's the other thing as well. I know uh, we, by the, by the nature of the fact that we appear in the videos, we do get an awful lot of the positive comments you guys very, very kindly leave on the rescue videos. But it isn't just Simon and I that do the rescue side of things. There's a whole team of people that will go out and do anything at any time of night. So uh, thank you to all of those guys as well. I know they don't feature, some of them don't particularly enjoy being filmed and that's perfectly fine. Uh, but there are a lot more people that do work behind the scenes as well, as I'm sure you'd agree. Laurie, well, you've got to remember it's all about me. I shall have a very funny story. <laughs> I can't mention the charity, but there was somebody else who runs quite a big charity 
and he had a row with the guy who was working with him and he said to him, I am the brand, I am the brand. So, you know, I've decided I'm going to be the brand, Laurie. I'm going to be the brand of Wild Love. When I'm dead, the brand will die. But for now, I'm going to be the brand. I think it's quite funny. And to okay. our new, to our new media... Our brand. Hello yeah, to he's the gone. new Wildlife Aid. The I new strategy. We've got. I know. You remember that now, haven't you? Um, we've got a new guy on board to help Laurie and Abby. He's just there, really, to help and advise and get some strategy going. Because I'm the most unfocused person you'll ever meet. I'm just like a scatter gun. I just bleh, everywhere until it happens. Um, but we've got Matt on board now, who's uh, it's only beginning of his work, and he's he's walking. He's talking the talk. Let's just hope he walks. No, it's, it's got this right. He's talking the talk. Let's hope he walks the walk. You I'm sure right. he will. He's been. That right he's been. I know. I did. I ruined everything. So I'm so tired. Um, <laughs> he's been very good. But I mean, he tells us all sorts of stories about other charities, and it's quite interesting. Let's just say. But yeah, we're we're really trying to push forward. We have got. I know Laurie hates me to talk about money, but we've got 20 acres to sort out. We've got a massive amount of money to that, and I know Laurie's going to ask you something about this later on because there we do have. I know I preempted this, haven't I, Laurie? And you're going to get cross. Yeah. I don't care. We can go into but it. But we, we've, we've got a possibility of getting a very, and when I say very large pot of money, Laurie will know that I don't say very large pot of money unless I mean a very large pot of money from um, one of the Surrey funds. Yeah. But it really relies heavily on people voting for us on the online form, which link uh, Laurie or Abby will put the link up for you but they predominantly need to be people who are living in Surrey. So for all of you in the States, you know, obviously put it out, it's not gonna hurt, but we're, it's, we're looking for Surrey people because this fund is basically for Surrey. Um, and it is, when I say it's a considerable amount of money, it could just about build the new center for us. It is that big. I've already said to Laurie, if we do get a grant through for that amount of money, he's got to make sure there's new batteries in the defibrillator because I will have a heart attack at the shock of it. Uh, it could be tremendous, but it needs a lot, a lot, a lot of votes. We need to get three or 4,000 votes at least to make it work. The link will go up if you know anybody in the Surrey area. And in fact, not only in Surrey, it's people who would use wildlife aid. And because we're going at the new centre, we're going to be doing much more than just what we do. We're going to be doing a lot of education. We're hoping people will come over from many neighbouring counties. So it will help them too. But to impress Surrey, who are giving the money away, we need to sort of focus it towards Surrey people. We've got two people at Surrey County Council, who I better not name, I should get into trouble, who are so keen for us to do this as we are. We believe this is an amazing center for the future. You know, you'll see later on how far we've got, you'll see how far we have to go, but with your help, we can do it. I will stop, stop talking about money now, because <laughs> it gets really funny, he's, he, and his goatee goes all twitchy when he starts <laughs> start getting cross with me. No, it's, I think um, for that we need to provide a little bit of background information. So if you are new to the channel and haven't really worked out where we're talking about with the whole 20 acres and new centre project, um, we are currently halfway through the plan to take what we have here at the centre, which is a roughly four acre site, I believe, uh, and we have absolutely filled that to bursting. We really, really need space to expand. And we want to do a lot more, not only in the, the rescue side of things, but in the education side of things, and really try and <coughs> maximize the reach that we can uh, possibly have and the differences that we can make. So we've actually very, very luckily, we've bought uh, 20 acres of land, which is about half a mile that way from where we are at the center at the moment. And the plan is to not only relocate the center down there and have a much bigger and more specialist wildlife center, but also get into education as well. We'd have an education center that will teach school groups, will teach young kids about why the wildlife that we have here in the UK uh, is so important and what we can do to um, strengthen that and to help it and why we need to do that. Um, we can run school groups and we can run a whole load of things down there. And we'll also have a wetland centre down there as well so that we can do our bit and try and encourage some of the wildlife in Surrey that is struggling a little at the moment to come back. So there is a big, big plan on that. And I know uh, a few of you have been following the progress of this. And uh, we actually have a little progress update on you. So uh, if you were to take a helicopter and fly over the site at the moment, this is what it would look like. So this is the plot of land that we have. So there's 12 acres to the right hand side of that and seven acres to the left hand side of that. Um, and those three ponds, 
what, a month and a half ago, maybe slightly more than that, weren't even there. So this is the work that has been done already. This is the start of the wetlands. So we're putting the ponds in. All of that brown space that you see on there will be planted in the next couple of weeks um, to months. There's a lot of volunteers and Jacob and a lot of um, guys that we're working with as well that are going to make that happen. And then hopefully, once we get that up to date, it will look a lot more like this. And this is an overlay of where the building plans are. So Simon, do you want to talk through a little about what we hope to have down there? Yeah, so the area to the left hand side, which has got the orange buildings on it, that will predominantly be all the animal pens and the wildlife hospital and all the, all, all the important part of wildlife, what I call the important part of wildlife aid. Um, on the, the blue below the orange, are the two avenues, there's two legs of the wildlife hospital. One will be the wildlife aid leg and you literally go down either left hand or the right hand stream. Um, or if you've got a domestic animal, we're hoping to have a, a, a domestic veterinary surgery there so you can bring your animals there as well um, because we think you know people will hopefully like what we do and they can bring their animals to us as well because we do care. So that's the sort of the, the basic, the, that's wildlife aid magnified by about two. Uh, but then when we go into the 12 acre site, we always wanted when we bought this site to, to do our own little bit of rewilding. We wanted to put a wildlife corridor back into a land because that road at the bottom, that big white thing at the bottom is the M25. Um, and you might think heavens above, what's crazy wildlife can't live there. But when we were building this site on the 12 acres, which is where the three lakes are, we had, I mean, about 10 or 12 massive earth moving machines every day, making a lot of noise doing all this. And yet there was a road deer at the bottom. So the extreme right hand side of that picture, you'll see a bit of green. Uh, and there was a roe deer with a fawn there every day, just out there eating, munching away, having an okay time taking no notice of these movers at all. So wildlife can exist quite happily right next to the busiest road in the UK. Um, so that's what we're trying to achieve. So we're gonna give some wildlife habitat. We're gonna build a hospital. We're gonna try to educate anything from children to vets to vet nurses to rehabbers to groups uh, who are environmentally interested uh, and we've got a lot of people we've got two amazing people on board particularly to help us with the environmental side and the and the plant side one is uh, a Rami Sami who, who who works for uh, a large company but he's looked at our project a few months ago and got really excited about it so for for his help massive thanks and we've got my favourite lady who lives in Ashton, Pat Wiltshire, who is incredible. She's done all sorts. She's a forensic scientist, a forensic, and she works with sort of botanists. But if you Google Pat Wiltshire, she's the most amazingly clever woman. Why she talks to me, I have no idea, because I'm as thick as two planks. She's obviously incredibly clever. She goes all over the world solving mold, uh, sol solving, I've had, I'm too tired, Laurie, solving murders by looking at sort of what plant, seeds or something's on somebody's shoes in the field where they were she can sort of actually work out where it was and what happened and whether the guy was there at the right time and she's she's so clever it scares me when she talks to me because i don't understand a word she says i have to just nod and pretend that i understand and, and she sorts it out so between the, those two and some other experts we're going to get this site right and the whole idea with this site when we start planting 12 acres is to do it once and do it right what we don't want to do is do it wrong and we don't want to have to do it again and again and again. So we're really keen to get this absolutely spot on the first time. We want to open bits of the river bank up so the public can see it because it's, the river mole actually is incredibly pretty. Uh, we've got kingfishers down there. We've got little egrets down there. We've got water voles down there. So we just want to give our visitors a little bit of a chance to see that. We will have quite hopefully, if we can get it sponsored, anybody listening, if we can get it sponsored, we're going to have quite a complex CCTV system down there so we can zoom in on any bit we want to. We can see it day and night. In fact, we've just bought a new camera which will go up on one of the 12 meter poles, which is very scary because that's quite high, um, that we'll be able to zoom in to the other end of the field, that's 500 meters away, to a headshot of a small animal. So I'm getting excited, I haven't seen it yet and we haven't got the pole up yet. But it's all in plan. I mean, there's so much planning on it. There's so much yeah. work gone into this to get it right. And we just, you know, we keep deciding to do something, then changing it because we want to make sure that when we do it, we don't have to change it. It will be brilliant, guys. It will be brilliant. We are obviously still looking for sponsors. We're looking, hoping for high net worth individuals. If there's anybody in Surrey who really wants to put their name on a building or more or whatever, 
and sponsor this project. It will be the most amazing legacy to leave your children and your grandchildren because we need to do all we can for our children and grandchildren because we've left them in a, a pretty dire state. I blame my generation more than Laurie's um, because you know we should have known better. But nobody told us we should have known better. That's the trouble. We look for guidance. <clears throat> That's really why we started IDOT. IDOT was a thing where, you know, we look at the environmental situation, global warming, planet, climate change, whatever, and we think, well, there's no point us trying to do anything. What can we do to solve this absolutely worldwide problem? Well, the answer is we think we can do nothing because we're just one person. But if everybody in every country did one action a day, it would make huge difference. In the UK alone, if everybody did one thing a day, that would be 24 billion actions. Laurie normally falls asleep at this stage because he's heard this from me so many times. But you know, just think, 24 billion actions. That's more money than Laurie will ever have in his entire life, even if it was in what pennies. A long way. In pennies. <laughs> he would never make it. So no, but we are excited. I think it's a great project. I love it. I've obviously lived it, dreamt it, slept it, had nightmares about it since 2014. Um, but to see these lakes the other day, when we started building lakes, I got quite excited. When the lakes were half full, I said, oh, it's not very impressive. But then we went down literally only the beginning of last week and we saw these lakes full. And I must admit, guys, I did have quite a large tear in my eye, which was spilling down my face because it does look magnificent. And yet it hasn't even greened up yet. I was down there today. It's just beginning to green up now. But when that's all green and we've got all the plants in and all the planting done all the way around the site, as you're going up there now, just at the top of you now, that's where the platform starts. That's where the new hospital and the education centre will be. I am so excited. I can't believe it's going to happen. And when you know, I bought the site in 2014, I suppose in the back of my mind, I thought, well, this is never going to happen. It's a nice pipe dream. And then we, you know, we started the work down there and I began to think, oh, this is real, guys. This really can happen with a bit of luck and a fair wind. So the lakes are in. We're going to start planting them next week. That's if Jacob doesn't drown in the lakes when he goes in and plants mm -hmm. all the plants. Um, and then from there on, we'll start planting outwards. And we've got Rami and we've got Pat and other people to help us just work out what to plant where for the best, best possible action for the animals and for us. Uh, it's going to be brilliant. I'm so excited. I cannot contain my excitement. You can see that on Laurie's face. Look, he's fallen asleep. Laurie has fallen asleep because I've no, been just, talking. You, you've been talking for 10 minutes solid at this point. I'm just, I'm yeah. waiting to see how long it goes on. I need to get my own back, Laurie, because you normally take over from me and I fall asleep. Guys, any more questions? Laurie, say something, do something. There's quite a few. Uh, just before we get into questions, as Simon was saying before, with the new site, uh, this fund that we potentially might have access to will be going to fund this. Unfortunately, a large project does require um, the budget to match it, and we are we are a charity. We're unable to do that just by ourselves. So if you can, just head over to the link that Abby has took down in the uh, the chat, both on Facebook and on YouTube. Uh, if you can, head over there and register your support. It will be a huge help. It takes just a few seconds. All you need to do is say that you support it and we stand the chance of uh, getting a, a Massive. contribution that Massive. would make a huge difference. Yep. So if you can, that would be very, very kind. And when you've done that, guys, honestly, if you live in Surrey, if you've got any friends, any anybody, please, just for the sake of uncle, bully them and ask <laughs> them to sign it as well. Because if we can we get... We don't condone to... bullying. No, uh, no, don't we? Oh, no, no, I only bully Laurie. <laughs> no, Laurie bullies me, that's not true. No, anyway, we need three or 4,000 signatures to make it really, really impressive because this fund is there. They don't have to give it out. They don't always have to give it out. But if they're impressed enough by what, what you know, the project is and that there's enough support for it, this is obviously predominantly for Surrey animals, but we do advise all over the country and we even advise abroad. We get so many calls from abroad asking us questions and, and we can answer a lot of them. So it's for the good of all and it really is for the benefit of our wildlife and our habitat and for everything else because we need to redress the damage that we've done to this planet over the last two or three hundred years. I will now get off my soapbox, Laurie, and you can have a full <laughs> 30 seconds to speak all by yourself. Nice. We've got a lot more questions actually. So Rose has asked, uh, did you do any rescuing from last week's flooding in London? Uh, so we didn't have any particular rescues, but we had a lot of cases um, from that. We had many, many animals that had been stuck in drains or in um, ditches or anything like that that had then filled up with water. We had a lot of hedgehogs. We actually had a few little owls as well that got stuck in that. So we did see uh, our fair share of cases from that. Luckily, we didn't have to do anything 
sort of major rescuing foxes from rivers or anything like that, but I do know of a few rescues around, uh, around this area that have. So unfortunately, yes, uh, the wildlife has not fared particularly well as a result of that one, and it's been raining a lot more today, so we'll see what happens with that. Um, look, I'm a Jedi has asked, uh, did, have you ever thought of designing your own nets? And you have, actually. We have. We've had long conversations. There's one particular net we like to build, and I'm actually I'm now going to make a note, because I haven't rung them for two or three weeks. They were promised to, des to build a special net for us. What we want is a net that is open, just like everything, but then when we get the animal in it, we can, at the very front, it's not in the middle, it's got to be right at the very front, we can shut it down, rather like a Venetian blind, just bring it down to keep the animal in it. Um, they were going to design this, they've, they failed miserably at this stage, so I will now ring them tomorrow and ask them how they're doing. So yeah, we've looked at our own nets, we do design a lot of stuff, I mean a lot of stuff we, we, we make to suit us, we use, you know, keep nets which are for catching fish, we, we design so we can catch animals in them, we've designed the special, we the, duck and ducklings, usually. The, the special sheets for getting deer out of gates, we've designed a lot of kit over the years. And in fact, when you go all over the world, actually every other centre, or not every other centre, but at some of the big centres have designed something at probably much the same time as us without any conversation between us both. But we both know what we want and we design it and we use it and we work it. Um, I'm still trying to design something to stop Laurie talking so much, but that is just a work Gaffer in progress. Thank you for that, Laurie. You will remember that. <laughs> Uh, Armpit First was asked, if a badger is ousted from the set, where would you then release them? If it's an adult badger, we would put it back. The only reason it's been ousted is probably because it's not well or it's too old. If it's very old and it's got no teeth and it really hasn't got a life, they do leave the set and they go and live a very nomadic life until they die. Um, and if they're very poor, we do euthanize because it obviously is at the end of his life because he can't find food, he can't get food. Yeah. It's if they've got no the teeth, end. sadly, they can't eat. So I found like me, Laurie, on a, on a bad day. Um, so we do that. But, you know, for this badger, which we just released actually the other day, Laurie and I released it, 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 it was a, a, a mid-aged badger, probably three or four years old, great set of teeth. It has obviously been got axes that time of year, so it was weak, perhaps it hadn't had enough to eat, perhaps it was just a bit depressed. It went out from here, like all my badgers do, extremely rotund and very fit and very well, and it zoomed off, it knew exactly where it was going. So we put adult animals back to where we found them, providing it's the right habitat, not in the middle of a town or something stupid. We'll put them back where we found them with the babies. We can be a bit more choosy, we can find a good habitat, give them a start at home so they have somewhere to go, feed it until they find their own food, so we can work that so they just gravitate back to where they we want them to be um, in exactly the right habitat. Yeah. Interestingly, we do get an awful lot of comments, especially when we put videos up about foxes, um, about, yes, I've just noticed the, the 199 for the gaffer tape. I love that. Thank you very oh, much, Anthony. Anthony, I love you. Gaffer tape <laughs> for Laurie's mouth will be bought tomorrow. I promise uh, you. We've got so many rows of that. <laughs> Uh, we, we get a lot of comments about why we release foxes in urban <coughs> environments if we had caught them up in an urban environment. And the thing is, with foxes or any sort of territorial species, it is absolutely vital to release them back where they were found. It might not seem ideal to you and I um, that a fox is living in the city and we can just put it in a forest, but they know where their <laughs> territorial boundaries are, they know where to find food. Uh, <coughs> Simon's quietly dying. I'm just dying um, now. Find shelter, find mates. They know how to cope in that environment. And to be honest, if you take a, an urban fox and put it in a rural environment, often they won't be able to cope. Um, and research has shown that an awful lot. And it may not seem ideal to us, and we'd love to see all animals living out in forests and wide open spaces, but unfortunately that isn't how a lot of them um, exist <coughs> and rural animals and urban animals have adapted to be very different and we have to make sure that's maintained so uh, hopefully that's a little uh, easy to understand and Simon is still dying are you okay? I'll try not Your to die it's just, I know, everything's watering I'm so tired I don't know what to do with myself it, Rather ju like just you. a little tip uh, liquids are meant to go down into your stomach not into your lungs yeah I could be getting that wrong <laughs> could well be getting that wrong uh, so, Laurie, uh, we've only got two minutes left. You've been talking so much, I've not got a word in edgeways. You've got two minutes. Oh, look, we just had 269 knocks in. I don't know uh, what okay knocks are. Norwegian kroner. Okay, thank you for 269 Norwegian kroner. I've no idea what it's worth. Nobody has yet given me a crib sheet so I can say, oh, that's equivalent to that. But everybody who's donated tonight, thank you so much. Anthony's 
actually given us so many £1.99s that he's probably given us a thousand quid and he's going to have a heart attack when he works it out later on. Um, Sven, always brilliant, always generous. To everybody, thank you, because what you give us means we can do more. It's as simple as that. Yeah, so, Dr. Um, Laurie, they're calling you Dr. Laurie now. God oh, help I, us, I did Laurie. apply for a PhD, but didn't get uh, <laughs> accepted on it. So no I'll give you a PhD, <laughs> but the initials stand for something different. Uh, let's not get into that. Okay. Uh, Cheryl has asked, how long is it until sparrows nest again, and will they return to the same nesting spot? So I think um, that, that really depends on what happened with the last brood. It does, and it, it depends on all sorts of things. It depends upon the weather. We sometimes get birds nesting even two or even three times. Last year we had one nest here that went. the parents went back three times. It depends upon weather, climate conditions, all sorts of things, and whether it's successful. And obviously the predation of, of wild birds is very high. Um, that's the bad thing. I mean, there's so many birds get predated this time of year, not only from cats, but from sparrowhawks and kestrels and all sorts of other things. They don't always make it. So um, they, nature's clever. You know, I remember when it's, once when I went out to uh, Tasmania, we were out there looking at the Tasmanian devils. I'll never forget that trip because a, a young one came up to me. And I thought, oh, what a sweet little thing. It bit me really hard on the bottom. I was not, <laughs> I was not impressed. The whole crew were wetting themselves with laughter as I went, ow, that really hurt. But, you know, Tasmanian devils, they got this facial tumour disease uh, quite a few years ago now, and a lot of them died, and it's the only, uh, as far as I know, the only cancer which can can be transmitted from patient to patient. So, <clears throat> big problem, Tasmanian devils just dis disappeared, not disappeared, but their population was plummeted to nothing. So instead of them becoming sexually mature at two and a half years old, which they always did, they suddenly became sexually mature at 18 months old. So there's nature going, hi guys, we've got a problem here, we need to get our population back, let's do this. And it's just so incredible how clever, how understanding and, and resilient nature is. I just wish we were not so stupid as a species. And I say, and I say it now, I'll probably get myself into a massive amount of trouble. There's only one invasive species on this planet nowadays, and that's us. That's the thing, about well over 90% of the cases that we deal with are directly or indirectly due to human beings. It's very rare. Um, even some of the comments on the, the video of the, the two rutting roe deer, just to remind Simon of that, um, a lot of those are saying it's actually quite rare to see on the channel a case that we deal with that's not caused by man. And that is actually the case. Um, so much of the stuff that we do is, is due to human interaction and not always intentional, unfortunately sometimes it is, but we do have to realise that we are causing problems and that we have to change that to allow that animal to thrive. The vast majority of the, the impacts that hedgehogs have um, the hedgehog population loss that we've suffered over the past 50 years has been due to human beings, either running them over, fencing things off, using slug poisons and things like that. We are the cause of this, and we are the ones that then need to rectify it. We've been frightfully serious tonight, Laurie, haven't we? Laurie, Laurie, this is Simon here, talking to Laurie. We're doing our BBC voice. We've been frightfully serious tonight, but I must just tell you, Laurie, we have run about two minutes over time. And I know everybody has is loves listening to you. I don't need to do the next one. Laurie can do the next one by himself. Because no. he just says everything I said within reason. Um, no, it, it's great being with you guys. We love your questions. We love your enthusiasm for what we do. Um, and we're here. We are here for the animals because of you at the end of the day. So I'm going to say donations once more. Anything helps. You know anybody. Yes. You know anybody who might want to help the new centre. Fantastic, yeah. Laurie. I'm, I'm going to let also you. There's been an awful lot of people that have actually donated to this stream um, as we have been live. So thank you so so much to all of you. Uh, as we say every single time, we are not funded by the government or anything like that. We can only thank do what we do thanks to public Laurie, support. Stop. I love this one. I just want to see what happens. I want to hear Laurie's BBC voice. Laurie? No, that would just be me imitating you. So that no, would come on, off you way. go. BBC voice. It's whenever we do. Uh, so the voiceovers that you guys hear on the video, we actually record in house, and it's amazing when we take Simon into the voiceover booth to record these. How different his voice suddenly becomes. Suddenly, like, hello. <laughs> Go, oh, come you, on. You, no, you I'm not doing it. Because you started the bit. Go forever. on. This Laurie is on the forever. Laurie's going to sign off in his BBC voice. Oh. 
Question from what? Abby. Um, someone on Facebook has said their daughter has just helped a deer out uh, that was trapped in a gate and they think she's paralysed but she's producing milk and looking for a fawn. Any ideas? Can we help? So it depends it depends how long it's been in the gate. Certainly, if it, you just got it out of the gate, if it's out of the gate, I would leave it for at least, at least half an hour, possibly an hour, to see what happens. Because it might just be deer are very odd, like any animal. They'll get into a bad situation, they get hit by a car or something happens and it's just that their brain switches off and it needs to rewire itself. And often we ring people up and they say, will you come out? And we say, no, leave it an hour and they get really cross with us. And then they ring back in about 45 minutes and say, well, it's, it's gone, you know, it's done it by itself. So leave it for about 45 minutes at least. I don't know where they're calling from, but if necessary, after 45 minutes or even maybe an hour, um, if it's still not moving and if you haven't seen its back legs move at all, then it's worth ringing your local wildlife centre just yes. in case. Yeah. But they can take sometimes over an hour before, you know, they can take over an hour to get themselves back into gear again. It's really strange. Yeah, Laurie went out to one the other night that looked really, really bad and, you know, left it, looked at it, it's, everything seemed to be working and an hour later it had gone. Yeah. Either just that relocated or it off the road where it was and just wasted around with it. And it might have been that Laurie had had a couple of drinks and couldn't find it when he went back an hour's time, but never mind. Never mind, uh, guys. The, the thought's there. Okay, but Laurie, sign off. We're way over time. You sign off. I'm going to say it's good night from me and over to BBC Laurie Braley. <laughs> uh, just to finish off with the, the advice with the deer as well. Um, with that, if someone does come down and unfortunately the deer can't be saved or it dies or anything like that, the, the, you have about 24 hours when you can try and find that fawn if the mother is lactating. So it is worth, if unfortunately that adult doesn't make it, um, try and search the area. It could be quite a long um, way away. Mothers will actually leave their fawns for quite an extended period and will go quite far to try and find food. But if um, the mother doesn't make it, then we will need to, or wherever you are, um, try and search for that fawn. Because unfortunately, if it is young and it is still relying on milk, it won't survive without uh, mum or human intervention. Laurie, sign happen. off. BBC Voice, please. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, guys, once again for tuning into this on Facebook and on YouTube. We really, really do appreciate it. Thank you to everyone that has um, put in questions, put in donations, um, either here on YouTube or over on the website as well. We really do appreciate it. You guys are the reason we can do what we do and the reason that we can um, to continue to do it. So thank you so, so much. Uh, and as always, we will see you in four weeks. And hopefully, I'll have shaved by then. I'm sure uh, Simon will agree to that one. I shaved, Laurie. I shaved. <laughs> I shaved. If not, I might be tired. There we go. Guys, thank you so much. Love you hugely. Mwah to everybody. Thank you. <laughs>